So when we do testing, it's about 10% of the results we can't interpret. And I think that whilst the horizons of genetics is exciting, there's a, there's a great deal we don't yet understand. <coughs> we still don't find mutations in many patients in whom we have a very clear diagnosis. And again, Queensland, you can be pleased because the future's here. We are already doing panel testing. We are already testing 50, 60 genes at a time from the conditions that we see. But we still don't frequently find a mutation. So we do need to put the research, which is finding these certainly here in the Translational Research Institute. Now we have some questions that have been um, already put forward, as, uh, some that will be asked from the floor tonight and some that I will ask on, on your behalf. So we might actually begin with one of those questions that's been submitted to us. We have a microphone here. Is uh, Jane Fitzpatrick with us? considerations around handling unexpected or unwanted genetic data. For example, if a person is being screened for breast cancer risk, but it's discovered that they're an, at an increased risk of developing motor neuron disease, how can, will, or should this be handled? I guess it comes under a few umbrellas there from the genetic point of view and from a legal consideration, doesn't it? Nadine, would you like to make a comment on it? Obviously, we're analyzing this looking for a gene that affected skeletal growth or development, but there was a small chance we were going to find something that was unrelated to that in that family. So what we've said in our consent form is the way that we analyze the data, it's highly unlikely we're going to find something, but if we do find something in a condition where there's treatment or screening that's going to make a difference to outcome, we're going to offer that information back to people. However, if it's in a condition where there's no screening or treatment that's going to alter anything like neurodegenerative and we're not going to offer that information back. Now we've done 2,000 whole exomes so far, I've analyzed a subset of those, and that we haven't had incidental findings yet. But you raise an interesting point, because the medical geneticists out in America, the American College of Medical Genetics, have raised the issue of, if we're going to do this, looking at one particular thing, do we have a responsibility to then look at a group of other conditions where there is screening and treatment available at the same time? We have all this data, you're looking at this amount, should you look at more? So the, there's a lot of conversation around, if so, what subgroup do we do and what, how do we analyze it? So um, it's a very poignant point, very, very good question. Matt, did you want to add anything to me? Uh, actually, I think she covers it very well. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, I mean, I went through the same process that, uh, that um, Lawrence went through with having my genome sequenced and uh, was delighted and relieved to find that I actually had no abnormalities, so I have the perfect genome. <laughs> <laughs> but then I found that I only looked at 2,000 genes, and uh, so um, I... Either that or perhaps I should have talked to your wife. <laughs> <laughs> I, I share the anxiety, and there are plenty of things I wouldn't want to know about. Um, and I think uh, we need to build that, that in as an option for people. I don't think we should regulate whether people can find out everything they want to know or not, but many people, myself included, uh, there'd be plenty of things I really don't want there's nothing I can do about it and it's not going to affect me until uh, way later in life. Yeah, I think that's the confusion. It's not about I'm going to live forever because the inevitable is inevitable. But, it, it, but if there is that opportunity to be able to just look at particular areas, if you do have a genetic predisposition, even if it's something that isn't one of those major inherited diseases, but something that you think you've inherited genetically because you, you, know, you, you see patterns. And that's probably one of the things that's changed too, even in my lifetime, that now when you just go to your family doctor, you're asked for some basic family history. That wasn't always the case, was it? No, I mean, I think the College of General Practice is aware now that GPs need to have a good knowledge of genetics. And I, I say, going back to the questioner's point, some people put it in the opt-in, that you have to choose to get those results rather than be given the results automatically. And I think that's, that's the biggest point of contention. The American College of Medical Genetics changed their view. They were going to make you have to have the results, and now they said it's opt-in. And I think, I think, you know, general practitioners are also going to get answered about these questions. So far, they're referring to our service, but it's just becoming more complex. We're going to need to include general practitioners in, in understanding it. It's just one of the 
the reasons why we need to have a coordinated just a genetic testing service where we don't have just people posting a spit sample off to somewhere else and getting a, you know, an internet uh, um, report back. You need to be advised <coughs> in advance the way you were and the way I was mm. about what the potential outcomes are going to be so you can decide what you actually want to find out or not. You don't just get an email saying you're going to get a honey horse career and work it out for yourself. Here's an internet site to work out. One of our non anonymous questions is, is, is a little bit along those lines of who owns our genetic information. So the question is who owns my genetic information and who can demand access to it? What are the government provisions for or planned provisions for genomic health care, especially with regard to private health care service providers and Medicare payments? We clearly touched on that this evening during uh, the Minister's um, speaking and, and uh, Professor Devereaux, but perhaps that's more of a discussion given that we've sort of talked about the fact that it should happen but nothing's actually happening. Yeah, look, it's a difficult issue. The, the Privacy Act does cover the use and dissemination of um, genetic information. But I think, as the Minister says, there's an urgent need for, for review across the board to make sure that we are carefully controlling that sort of information. Uh, in some ways, it's, it's no different than any other personal private medical information. Um, but person, for example, an employer who gain access to that information would have an enormous difficulty, I think, switching off from the concept that one of their employees might develop a particular illness in the future, which might disable them from being a good employee. So I think the short answer is um, we're working in a grey and difficult area. At the moment. Minister, is there actually a, an advisory board in place? Is there actually something ha happening in the space, or is it a, a, in the, the process? getting to that point? Well, as I've indicated before, I mean, we're trying to develop a framework here in Queensland, and I suppose it's one of those difficult things you have in the Federation. Who's going to go first? Is it going to be good enough? And I don't think what we've got is good enough, and there's no doubt about that. So we are going to now work through uh, with those that are very, very interested in uh, genetics in Queensland, those that are actually researching in the area, uh, those that actually uh, are concerned about it on an ethical basis, and of course those that are no doubt are concerned about protecting their interests as well. Um, insurance companies and others need to actually be a part of this discussion. But the very, very uh, strong basis for it has to be is that the interests of the individual is paramount. Uh, that for insurance, insurance, for example, is something that has always operated with very, very few exemptions in basically recognising that you actually spread the risk across a particular cohort and that a person should not necessarily be discriminated against or uh, in any way disadvantaged because of what they may, may get at some particular time, with the exception of a very, very few circumstances uh, or incidents. So it, it really is a no man's land at the moment and we have to fix it or otherwise we are going to have a very poor platform to provide our researchers uh, for what they need to do in the future question the ownership of this particular material and also give confidence for the community at large. Matt, how important is it moving forward that this, that the data, the non-identified sequencing is used then across a, a few different areas when it comes to being able to take all of this massive amount of information to not only treat the individual, we've talked about that a little bit, but now you're going to have the ability to look at all of the non-identified genome sequences to look for patterns or for treatment options perhaps, where it's not necessarily about Matt Brown's sequence, but... Yeah. So yeah. look, I think um, having the genome resource available for researchers in an anonymised format is absolutely critical for us to get the most out of it in a research perspective, but also in a clinical perspective. So to come back to Julie's example about Angelina Jolie, uh, what people do nowadays is that they sequence the BICA1 and 2 genes and then they look up a database which has got, you know, if you've got this particular mutation, this is the likelihood of you actually getting a tumor. And uh, so that's just with regard to two genes in effectively one disease. But writ large, we're talking about 21,000 genes across tens of thousands of different gene diseases if you include all of the common diseases as well. Uh, and so we need to have uh, ways that internationally we can share the data and link that up to um, clinical outcomes so that clinicians can go to look at databases and say, okay, I've got, you've got this
this mutation or this combination of mutations and be able to, with some certainty, predict the likely outcome of that. We can sort of do that with clever bioinformatics, but we're not nearly as good at that as we'd like to be, and really most of the information is going to come about through sharing of it. The other thing is that you know the research world has gained a heck of a lot by sharing genetic information in terms of being able to then work out the basic causes of disease and identify new treatments. And uh, if we use this resource that's coming about through healthcare um, investment, we should get a huge research return in terms of working out what the basic causes of all of these diseases are and the cancers are, and then come up with better treatments as a consequence of that. We have a question from Marlene Flores. Are you with us tonight? Fantastic. Could we get a microphone there? Thank you. Uh, I would like to know what's the role of epigenetics in autoimmune diseases like Hashimoto disease or lupus? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right, so, so firstly, for those of you who don't know what epigenetics is, so we talk about genetics as being the variation in the letter code of DNA, whereas epigenetics are modification of those individual bases like the GCTA sequence of DNA so that little bits get stuck on the side of those bases and they change the way the DNA is actually functioning and being read off. And it's actually really a pretty important part of how the chromosomes determine about how cells function and how, how diseases arise, this other form of modification of DNA. And that modification can actually vary during lifetime, whereas the sequence of DNA in a cell doesn't actually vary during lifetime. And so it's a way by which DNA can actually respond to environmental effects. So uh, it's an open research question at the moment about to what extent um, epigenetics actually contributes to common diseases or rare diseases. There are examples of epigenetic effects that operate in both common and rare diseases. But because uh, the science is actually only just now discovering the right sort of tools to be able to look properly at epigenetic effects, Largely, it's an unexplored area. So the answer specifically with regard to Hashimoto's and lupus is that um, people think that epigenetics are involved, particularly in lupus, um, but um, actually uh, knowing basic, uh, you know, clear-cut examples of how epigenetics actually affects the risk of those diseases is not going to establish it. I think what we also think with epigenetics that even with polar stem sequencing, even with the um, polar whole genome sequencing, there's still a significant gap not finding a cause of genetic disease. And it's likely that epigenetics may explain some of that. But again, as, as Matt said, it's early days. But there's a gap that we're not finding the cause. So even with the fantastic technology we've got now, it may be we need new technologies in the future to look at epigenetic phenomena and they may be part of it. There was another um, anonymous question that came in, I would assume, from somebody who works in the industry. And this is a very interesting area that it may seem a little complicated, but I, I, I'm sure that our panellists will be able to clarify it for those of us Minister and I who aren't working in the area. <laughs> this is about next generation sequencing. It's widespread use of next generation sequencing diagnostics will create a void of expert personnel situated between the bioinformatics output data and the clinician or genetics counsellor. Personnel filling this void need to be appropriately trained and have extensive experience in, in understanding next generation sequencing, bioinformatics output data, interpreting the data, and then finally drafting clinically relevant reports. What measures by government regulatory bodies and or universities have been enacted to ensure that this aspect of next generation sequencing diagnostics is appropriately monitored and undertaken by sufficiently educated personnel? If I had more time tonight, I was going to actually touch on this because I think that but politicians never seem to be able to get to the whole point of everything all the way through. <laughs> but I think it is one of our really big challenges. I mean, we've got amazing technology and research capability out there. But the very important thing is to actually have the ability to understand what we've researched and then to be able to translate it into practical use for the community at large. And that's by and large what has been asked as a part of that question. And I think that there is a significant void there. And that's one of the, the things that uh, 
we will be actually working across all the sectors to try to, to do, and that's how we effectively translate this and to grow that workforce. Informatics is very, very important. I mean, if you look at that information up there tonight, I mean, for the layperson, we're sitting there thinking, well, that's all very interesting. But then how do we actually take that, extrapolate it and put it into a usable form and to grow that workforce around it? And there's been a lot of research and there's been a lot of investment in this state over the last few years by governments of all persuasions and it has been something which has been done in a bipartisan way. And the thing that we're now very much focusing on is how we integrate that into the healthcare paradigm on a constant basis. So grow that workforce, make sure that it's out there, the technology is right for the interpretation and then uh, the, the, effects, the effective translation of it. And I know that this is something that our Chief Health Officer, Dr Jeanette Young, who's here tonight, is also uh, very interested and sees it as a very, very important part of getting a maximum benefit out of genomic medicine. If we don't, Matt, could it stop the places we could go in the short term? Uh, so I think it is going to be a rapid limiting step in the short term. Um, but I think also there's, it's an area where there's a huge amount of investment. So for example, I mentioned that uh, the US government has spent $3.8 billion on sequencing one genome. So that, from that has grown a huge industry of developing new sequencing methods, but also developing new bioinformatic platforms and new uh, systems for being able to um, interpret quickly and produce meaningful reports back to clinicians who are not expert uh, geneticists. Um, and that industry is now worth far more than the original investments in the Human Genome Project, such that uh, in 2012, the return on taxation in the United States was roughly double the entire investment in sequencing of one <coughs> genome in the first place. So in one year, they recouped more in taxes than they did in their entire period of the 12 years funding the Human Genome Project. And the sort of things that they're developing, I mean, I've got a dream that when um, you go to the GP and the GP prescribes you a drug for um, you know, your cold or, uh, or whatever other illness, uh, that they'll, plug, they'll type into their electronic prescription software and that software will link up with your information from your genome data and automatically inform the GP about whether that drug's safe for you or whether the dose needs adjustment for you, given that the vast majority of uh, drug side effects are actually related to enzymes that have major genetic variation in them. And so there, there's obviously a potential major clinical gain by using genetic information to inform prescriptions. Or when you go to the GP and the GP um, works out what your risk of having a heart attack is using a little calculator as they do, or have an osteoporotic fracture using a little calculator that they all have on their desktops, that that calculator will be linked up to your genome data as well. And we'll just plug in um, an additional level of certainty about uh, the likelihood that you're going to get an osteoporotic fracture or that you're going to have a heart attack or a stroke. And then that, that can help them inform uh, decisions about whether or not your risk is big enough that you need treatment. And those are pretty simple bioinformatic things for people to do. And we just need to get the industry going. And this is a real opportunity for Queensland as well to have an industry uh, developing clever software like that. We also talk a lot about the, our next generation of, of students. And you know, my children are certainly a part of it that may go into an area of science and have jobs that haven't been invented yet. Clearly, this is an area where there is so much room for growth and improvement. And our universities and keeping up with genetics, particularly when it comes to this void in between the informatics and data? Obviously, I have to say you a lot, but <laughs> <laughs> no, I think in general, I mean, there is a big gap in bioinformatics, which is hardly what the minister said, but we, the technology is making the price of sequencing plummet. We can see that already. But the interpretation of the data is key, and the interpretation of the data that is clin clinically meaningful is key. So I think there's a recognised a shortage of bioinformaticians in Australia, and there will be, unless more investment is put into it, but I think more generally, you've touched on GPs today, but I think um, medical people often don't have a good grasp of current genetics, and I think the education of doctors in general needs to be improved, and all health professionals, but also the public. I mean, the fact that people here tonight show that people want to learn more about genetics, and I think we need to just continue that dialogue with the public as well. Is John Hanley with us? John, would you like to ask your question? I'm, I'm sure that you can probably do it in a loud enough voice for us all to hear. <laughs> Um, human nature is great down there, and you do all the positive stuff, you're going to get an element of negativity. 
people that wanting to abuse the system. We've seen the Americans, the, the organisation they shut down. There's more places around the world that can offer the same thing in the marketplace. So what are we doing? We see it with surrogacy, we see it with stem cell research. What, and it's probably not a, an academic or researcher question, it's more of a political one, what are we going to do to try and control that need? Because if people want to do sequencing, it'll be going to sports performance in the future, and your kids are going to have a great IQ, they'll become brilliant people. What controls are you going to be thinking about to make sure that doesn't happen? Yeah, I mean, that's a very excellent question because there would be a myriad of different views in this room tonight, this auditorium. There would be people that would be thinking you know, the sky is the limit and there should be nothing whatsoever that should be limited as a part of this. There would be others saying that there should be a very, very strict uh, process around it where only certain information uh, should be made available to people you know, based on the, whether they want to know or otherwise, uh, how much that information then goes uh, to, to other people, a whole range of things. So you'll have a myriad of, of views. And that's why I think we need to make sure that from an ethical perspective in the development of this, uh, we get as much common ground as we can. I've been in the Queensland Parliament a number of years now and I sat through and participated in both debates on stem cell research in the state. The first one actually opened the envelope and promised not to push it. And the next one really pushed the envelope and actually took it to a place where we were told we weren't going to go. And it was quite interesting to see that there are a range of people who didn't want it there in the first place and actually got to that stage and some who were at that stage were prepared to go to the next one. And you, know, you never know what happens with the inflection of time. I think as Matt said earlier right on, the best way that we can protect that is to actually have uh, highly uh, ethical researchers working in a highly ethical environment uh, utilising the best law we possibly can so we can protect our own interests. Uh, in a world where we really don't have any boundaries, you can't really stop people who may want to go elsewhere to access something else. You can't do that. We've seen that with surrogates. All you can do is basically control what, your own, what you do on your own shores and by international agreement what happens beyond that. And that probably may not necessarily totally answer your question, but to at least have some sort of ethical consistency which has majority uh, support and direction that gives it a, a, at least a way to go. Can I answer your question? I think that's also the, uh, the unknown element that makes us human. I'd like to open the um, questions to the floor if anybody has something that they'd like to add from the presentations or the conversation we've had so far. Yeah? So you mentioned that How will the advances in machine learning affect genetics? Affect genetics? My guess is the transition phase, isn't it? I mean, is this when you're saying that machines are going to do all the analysis, you're not going to need blind conditions because of the pipelines will be automatic? Is that what we're sort of thinking? If you're trying to tease out some sort of information for what kind of, what sort of genes are creating a certain disease or affect a certain disease, right? So you need to do it manually and let a machine do it for you. So I'm just wondering what level are we at in terms of integrating machine learning? So um, that's not well developed here in Australia. Uh, Genomics England, though, are a couple of years ahead of us because at the end of uh, 2012, David Cameron announced a 100 million pound investment in establishing um, a genomics program for the NHS. And amongst that included uh, investment in automated reporting systems. They reckon it's many years off, five, 10 years off before uh, there's fully automated reporting. Uh, and at the moment, basically, what they're doing is setting up uh, groups of experts to use uh, partially analysed data to then manually annotate that data for people to actually get meaningful reports back from it. So it's somewhere where there's a huge amount of development required before it's actually going to become successful. I think it's likely to be successful earliest in single-chain heritable disorders, where although there is still a need for expert opinion, there is, it is a much simpler area to actually analyse and to come down to reasonably definitive uh, short lists or single gene variants that you know are important. But for cancer
cancer genomics, it's still very much a manual process, and uh, for common diseases, it's still completely a research area. We had another anonymous question, and Adina, I'm sure that there's something that you'll be able to comment on, uh, which was, is genetic screening available to a young couple considering children where one partner may have a genetic disease in their family background? Is it possible to get a genetic profile um, to aid the young couple in a decision about whether or not they would have children? Yes, so one of the things that clinical geneticists like Julie and genetic counselors like I do <coughs> is take people's family histories to try and identify what conditions they might be at risk for. So when I worked in prenatal, was one of the things that we did is get a family history of cystic fibrosis or Duchenne muscular dystrophy, then um, testing was available to see whether or not that person was a carrier. And then in the case of cystic fibrosis, if they were found to be a carrier, then testing would be offered to their partner to see whether or not they were a carrier as well and what their risks were of having an affected, person, affected child. And as we move into the area of genomics and even panels, as Julie mentioned, um, if for people who are of Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, instead of just one condition that you get tested for if you've got a family history, there's panels that we can test for a wide variety of other conditions as well but what we won't have is that I did see that at Stanford University earlier this month there was a, a feature film because you can always rely on Hollywood to given what you were just talking about they screened a film called Project 46 which was about a geneticist who was who came up with a program where you could go in and have your mapping done so you came up with the perfect 46 chromosomes and the premise of the movie was that you would breed out disease but I've been told that that's absolutely not possible, so it's not going to happen. <laughs> well, I mean, the other thing is that we have human diversity, partly because um, if the environment changes, then a different genome will actually be better. So there is no such thing as a perfect human genome. Not even yours? Not even yours, <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> that's well, close to Peter, you have a question? Um, from each of your points of view, it feels like Queensland is ahead of the curve here as far as the debate and the thinking and the technology and the research and if we can call ourselves ahead of the curve as far as the vaccination goes. In five years' time, where's, where's each of your concerns? Um, where have we got to be in five years' time to still be ahead of the curve? What will we have to achieve to stay in front? I think you could all probably comment on that. Well, so my wish list would be that Cancer, everybody who has a life threatening malignancy has the option of having that cancer sequenced. And I'd like to see that everybody who has a clinically significant single gene disorder has the option of having a genetic diagnosis within five years. And I think if we achieved that, that would make a huge difference to those two areas. Should have gone first. <laughs> regulatory uh, framework which uh, allows genomics to actually grow and flourish and protect the individual. And that's, I think, the most important thing that, that we can do and to actually support uh, this particular sector to the extent that the diagnostic and treatment capabilities are widely available within the community. And because it's about the right quality of care in the right place, utilising technology. And if we if you have far better knowledge about what you're doing, you actually understand what works and what doesn't work. That has a big benefit for the person uh, who requires that service, the patient, and also has a big benefit for the community. It means that scarce resources are actually going in the places that make the biggest difference and give the best outcome. Julie? I would have to feel like that's one of the that all Queenslanders can access timely uh, genetic services wherever they live. And John, from a legal perspective? Well, for me, the elephant in the room here is that we'll be discussing genetic advances in genomics as if it's a brand new world. Uh, I suspect we're rapidly approaching the scenario where it will become mainstream. Once that happens, we'll have some difficult questions in terms of if you go to see a GP and that GP doesn't offer you genetic screening, is he or she negative? 
So in a, in a world, in a commonwealth world, where we use reasonable skill and care, and not as I said in the presentation yesterday, in the words better, reasonable cure and scare, um, <laughs> we need to be starting to think about this as rather an exception-based reporting as mainstream, and what consequences that's going to have in terms of the individual's rights, both to control information, as the Minister was talking about, but also um, to access this in a timely and cost-effective manner. Any other questions from the judges? You're absolutely right. <laughs> well, yeah, can I just say, I, I think that that scenario for some would, would, they would think it's hypothetical and extraordinary. I don't think it is. I mean, if you look at where mobile technology has come within the last five or ten years, you could not even imagine it. I mean, what it can actually do now with regards to its internal diagnostic capabilities, you know, one of the upholster, all those sorts of things. I mean, it really only takes uh, a one drop of blood or to be able to get inside it somehow and you can do all these sorts of things. Now, of course, at the moment we require quite elaborate equipment, machinery and diagnostics around that. One just doesn't know. It's so exponential. I remember being at Cephalon in San Diego in 2001 at that stage when the whole genome sequencing process was really starting. And they were talking about that $3 billion. Well, as Matt said before, $1,000 or less. And the technology now is in a box in the lab. So, you know, if uh, we can only control what we can control within our own state and our own borders, beyond that requires collaboration and agreement. And that's the that's that's the big challenge. I don't have an answer. Is it possible for a Queenslander to come and get their genome sequenced without a medical referral? Is that something that's possible? The question is, is it possible to get a genetic... Sorry. My apologies. I'll get them to use big voices.
approval. Uh, and you, that always means that they, the patient has a committed counselling before and will most always have appropriate counselling afterwards as well. And so it's not available for a healthy individual? <coughs> uh, we haven't done it. Uh, I imagine that when we would start running large numbers of sequences next year, yes, we would be able to do that and we will do it. You put your hand up for a yes, didn't you? <laughs> Anybody else have a question for us? Yes. Read the microphone over here, please. Um, I just have a question about what is the outlook for mental health and genetic sequencing and whether there's any research being done for that. Uh, so the question was about what genetics research is being done using mental health disorders? Yes. So the answer is a heck of a lot, and I don't believe there's anybody here from Queensland Brain Institute or the Michelin Ray Group. Uh, but uh, UQ, for example, has an absolutely world-leading research group <coughs> institute working on, for example, um, genetics of schizophrenia. And uh, so um, across virtually every major uh, um, mental health disease area, there are large-scale genetic programs on. Take one last question. Um, I've got a question just about the funding uh, and the support for this sort of opportunity. Um, the price point of under $1,000 seemed deliciously simple to achieve, but uh, even in the domain of cancer care, where we're diagnosing thousands of new cancers across Queensland every year, when you think of that for every single patient, along with the appropriate clinical support and counselling, it actually in the first instance becomes a massive investment which we all hope will derive benefits in, a, in more targeted therapy and overall not just life improvement but cost savings in care in the future. But how are we going to get this up and running in the current environment? Well, it's, it's actually happening. It's happening, in, it's, it's happening around the country, um, in places around Australia they're investing in more complex equipment, that's the vision here, to invest in uh, more complex equipment uh, next year. Uh, the real issue of course is that the curve is such that the next year it's superseded and you've got something that's you know, far cheaper and a lot quicker and so you've got, you know, it just, it, so it's who is, who's in here first might be at the forefront but who comes second might actually have what is the, uh, is the economic advantage of it. But from our perspective as a government, we actually simply look at it as what's the right sort of treatment and opportunity for people because the diagnostic cost now uh, is coming down and down more, more and more with time. It is actually the other areas of health investment which uh, you know is escalating more. But the more appropriate that we can actually target that treatment if we know it works, then that is the thing that, 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 that makes it affordable into the future. But yes, we will diagnose more, and we'll know that we have to treat more, but we'll probably know how to treat better. Matt, do you want to add something to that? Also, I guess, goes back to what you said earlier, though, about the idea of prevention, that we're actually trying to get to the point where we know what may happen before it happens instead of treating it after it's happened. Yes, I mean, I think there are savings and there are costs that are going to be involved. There are savings in terms of using the right drug, um, using it better, uh, and preventing disease. So I think preventing common diseases is a way off. Um, but, you know, ultimately, uh, this is going to require government investment. The New South Wales government in June this year invested $24 million over the next four years in a program led by the Garvin Institute to roll out sequencing in cancer and heritable diseases in New South Wales and that's the sort of thing that we need to see happen here in Queensland if we're going to see this actually uh, succeed in this state. Yes, you wanted to add something? Just on the issue of prevention, uh, 
Now, not everyone that has a genetic mutation is actually going to die from that genetic mutation. And so I think we also need to put things into context. Uh, there are so many things that we can do in the other areas of prevention that would make an extraordinary difference as well. We live in a society where everyone wants a magic bullet or a magic pill uh, to the extent now that we can actually treat people against their own inability to be able to make the right life choices with regards to their lifestyle by giving them a pill. And I mentioned this to a journalist the other day and said we can get people now a pill if they're chronically obese to reduce their risk of heart attack, probably of cardiovascular disease, probably down lower than someone you know, who may actually have an underlying condition we don't know about. And uh, she just said, oh, what's a pill for? <laughs> and I just said, this is the thing, we're all like this magic pill, but if you look at, you know, there is no substitute for what is basically people actually taking control of their own health. Most things I think that will continue to cause us an early demise will be about negative lifestyle decisions, whether it be alcohol, you know, cigarette smoking, uh, whether it be uh, not exercising or poor nutrition. These sorts of things allow us to be able to get ahead of the curve uh, and to be able to treat in a range of other areas. And I don't think we should ever go away from that. But the concern I have that gives people this view that there's some magical treatment beyond the individual and their own power and responsibility. Well, it'll be interesting to see how genetic information will affect that and their behaviours. There's a great cartoon quote of two women smoking cigarettes, a woman going, I've had the genetic test, I don't have the susceptibility, I don't have to worry about it. And the other woman says, I've had the genetic test, I have the susceptibility, I'm a gene donor, I might as well enjoy it. So obviously we, there's a lot of research out there on how genetics is going to affect behaviour and, and common diseases as well. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I think we'll wrap up. Please put your hands together for our panellists this evening. the surface. There's certainly a lot of uh, conversations that will continue from this evening and certainly conversations that I think it's important that we're all aware of and a part of. Thank you for being a part of University of Queensland Diamantina Institute's first public forum. If you'd like to know more about UQ Diamantina Institute, there is some information up in the atrium and if you'd like to know how you could book a tour, then please make sure you see one of the staff members. It is a truly magnificent facility if you haven't had an opportunity to go and have a look, if it's an area of interest, please do. And keep an eye out for our next forum. We would love you to come along again and to bring a few friends. Thank you so much. Have a lovely evening and travel home safely.